What I want to shift to is thinking about response. What do we do? Um, but I'm going to pause just for a little bit before getting to, and again, I said no answers, but some thoughts, some convictions, some direction, some places where I at least have been going in my own thinking about this. But before jumping to that, I want to pause and address one question, because I get this all the time, uh, whether I'm talking about the stuff we've been talking about this morning or other issues. It's Sooner or later, someone says, well, what about that conservative church down the road? They're doing great, right? And we all have one of them in our neighborhood. You know, where I lived, it was Eagle Brook. What about Eagle Brook? They're doing just fine. They're getting Lutherans from our Lutheran churches that are dying. We should do what they're doing. Um, and I'll say two, two, one thing before I jump in and analyze that a little more. One thing is, yeah, there's a lot to learn from all kinds of traditions all around us, um, including traditions that we may not uh, agree with theologically, but they may be thinking about these matters in a really creative way, and I would want to, us to be open to learning from them. All kinds of traditions that are grappling with us, and when you find something that you feel is works or creative or an ex something you want to experiment with, do it. Um, at the same time, I want to kind of demystify just a little some of, the, some of our wistful longing um, or some of the way we imagine or even romanticize the trends in the church. Um, the, the common story is, you know, mainline church was all going all guns, great guns until the 60s or 70s, and then we must have gotten too liberal and kind of fell off the edge, and the evangelical church has come up, and they're just going strong. And I want to kind of put that last 30 or 40 years of history, which has in fact shown some serious decline. We, we began there in a little bit more historical context and think a little bit about that. So I describe this as my, the, my three Bs, the three Bs of church growth in North America. And I want to, by context, I want to like not focus just on 30 years, but I want to stretch to like maybe 300. So think a little bit about a little broader context of the church in North America. And I want to think about patterns of growth. That is, why is it that some churches have grown at certain times and others, and what are the factors behind that? So the three Bs of church growth in North America. The first one, the first B is boats. And what I mean by boats really is immigration. That when you track church growth patterns from the first settlers from Europe to this country until today, continuing today, um, the number one factor in church growth is immigration. And that continues. The, of the churches that have, I mentioned earlier, all of the Christian churches in North America have dropped in intensity. None have grown in the first decade of the 21st century. The one that comes close to being the exception is Roman Catholicism. And it is entirely because of the strength of the Roman Catholic Church in Latin America and immigration patterns. That's it. Absent the new immigrants who have already been Roman Catholics, they have the same trend lines that the rest of us do. And that's been true for 300 years. When people come, uh, they bring their faith, they plant, and they grow. Um, second thing, second B is bank accounts. What I mean by that is that for a very long time, the Protestant churches in North America, they were called the main line for a reason, because they were the main line of power and of wealth and of influence. And so for most of the history of the US, if there was shifting between evangelical circles and mainline circles, it was almost entirely from evangelical to mainline. Because as people began to climb the socioeconomic ladder, it became really clear that they could only be helped by joining a church one, one rung up that ladder. So if your family had come from a more conservative or rural background and uh, you were the first person to get a white collar job, you were a bank teller or something like that, it made a whole lot of sense for you to think about joining the church of the bank president. And that church was probably Presbyterian or Episcopalian. It, truthfully, it wasn't Lutheran. <laughs> we were the immigrant church for a very long time. Um, so there was kind of this economic or cultural status push from evangelicalism to mainline. What happens in the 60s and 70s is two things. One, um, the folks, the demographics that are forming the more conservative evangelical church, their own economic boats begin to rise, so there's less incentive to change churches for those reasons. Um, and the mainline itself begins to lose cultural influence, kind of what we were talking about, the erosion. It didn't seem like as much of an advantage. And I'm not saying people were thinking in a very calculated way about how can I advance my career. It just was kind of you were being swept in a certain direction in terms of your education and socioeconomics, and those 
precipitants uh, shifted. The third B explaining most of church growth in North America uh, is babies. And the fact of the matter is the biggest denominator that explains the gap between mainline attendance and growth in the last 40 years and evangelical growth is that evangelicals were having much bigger families just across the board. And part of the reason they're now dipping is because those families are getting smaller precisely because, again, they're going up the socioeconomic ladder. And across not just the country, but the whole world now, as families move from more impoverished conditions to wealthier conditions, family size shrinks for two reasons. One, you don't need as many children to care for your, your old age. You're more likely to have the children you have reach adulthood, that is child mortality shrinks as you have better health care. Uh, and increasingly, to make it up the socioeconomic ladder, you find it advantageous to have both uh, parents working. And both parents working makes it harder to have as large families. Um, and so those really are the three kind of Bs that for me are the untold story about the trends that we read so much about. Now, I don't know about you, but when I, when I first started working on this, I had two reactions. I thought, one, well, that's helpful. It puts it in context. It's not quite the story I've been presented, that somehow their just theology is just better. Um, but at the same time, I found it a little bit, you know, a little discouraging, actually, because most of what we're talking about is sociological trends. Uh, and it, that bothers me a little bit. Like, I, I believe it. I've seen all the stats. I've read the articles. It makes sense to me. But my question is sort of like, what, where's the fourth B here? That is, what about belief? You know, does it matter what we believe? Uh, and it turns out it, it does, not just what we believe, but in some ways how we believe. So a little bit, I want to compare, um, as the world began to become more pluralistic in terms of ethnicity, in terms of worldview, in terms of religion, all the stuff we're talking about, the mainline, more progressive church and the evangelical, fundamentalist, more conservative church made very different choices, uh, whether conscious or not, had very different reactions to all the stuff we've been talking about. On the mainline side, the, the word that for me probably best describes the mainline response to this increasingly pluralistic world is that it was a very cosmopolitan response. That is, it, it welcomed the diversity, it celebrated the diversity, it encouraged uh, understanding, getting to know the diversity and, and, and uh, respecting that. And if you're gonna kind of pick a, a, a image, or in this case, a bumper sticker for what captures that response, it's the tolerance bumper sticker, right? And people don't usually mean just mere tolerance by that. They mean more of acceptance. And that kind of captured that. So the response is cosmopolitan. The goal is tolerance. And the, the means or the strategy was education. As we started spending a lot more time teaching our youth to understand different religious traditions and options and to respect them. Um, and that began by uh, first getting to know other Christian traditions, going to the Roman Catholic Church or the Greek Orthodox Church, and then it would expand, and in our youth groups or our Sunday school classes, we'd have persons coming in from Baha'i or Buddhist or the Jewish synagogue, all to the good. Um, but there are some ways in which I think we may have, now what's happening on the one hand is the world is getting more pluralistic, uh, and we want to respect and accept that, which is all of the good. I don't think we realized that at the same time, it was sort of crowding the marketplace of stories. And we didn't really change the way we were teaching our story. We just added on, making sure we were teaching a little bit of everyone else's. So there's a way in which I think unconsciously, or again, or unintentionally, we spent a little more time, not more time, we spent a little more creative energy teaching our kids about the variety of options, assuming they were picking up ours. And when push comes to shove, it turns out they weren't. All right, so that's kind of the mainline response. Um, to characterize the more evangelical or fundamentalist response, the word I would choose is isolationist. They did not see, do not see, the increased plurality of the country as something to celebrate or something to welcome. In fact, it's quite threatening. Uh, it, it's uh, of concern. It is, they recognize that it, as a competitor for the time and energy and allegiance of their people. And so again, if you're gonna sort of pick one image to capture the sense of that response, it would be the four spiritual laws. I don't know how many of you, I should probably ask, how many of you have not ever had that put on your windshield? <laughs> but it was, it's a little pamphlet, it's a little tract, one of the most famous ones that is often distributed at sporting events or you come out in your windshield. 
And it kind of captures, uh, in a sense, both the evangelical uh, fervor, but also the strategy employed. Mainline was education. Let's teach about these traditions so we can accept and respect them. This was, let's teach our own people a very clear and strict code of beliefs. This is what you believe. This is what you do, we don't believe. And if you're not sure of that, um, and if you have an evangelical friend or sister-in-law or coworker or whatever, um, talk sometime, ask that person what he or she believes about baptism. And you will get a very clear presentation or an answer, at least in my experience, of why in fact they do not, evangelicals do not baptize babies, but baptize adults. And often citing scripture or the stories there and the rationale for that, they get it, they know it. By converse, ask some of our folks why we baptize babies, and we're like, because we do. <laughs> and we always have. And they're cute. <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, or justification by grace through faith, or law and gospel, or we're lost. Like, we know we've heard it, but as those being functional terms to help us navigate, it's not there. And so this kind of fundamental difference in approaching, and I'm not advocating for a more isolationist or let's look at as threatening, or, but there was kind of a very intentional catechesis that was happening that did not happen even though we kept calling what we put our kids through catechetical class or confirmation. Um, that's a very different way. And, and, and part of the reason I lift that up is although I may not uh, share the theology or read the world through the same lens, I do think that they more quickly got the idea that the church is a place of faith formation, that you cannot assume that people absorb it. Um, it's not by uh, osmosis, that it in involves teaching and relationships and time spent for people to understand and make sense of their faith. Um, all right, so then, given this, what can we do? And what I want to invite you into is what I describe as an exercise in reconsiderations. Um, and to highlight that or to in invite what I want to think about or, or maybe symbolize what I want to think about, I don't know, how many of you have ever done the nine dot puzzle? Um, it's, it's a really easy thing. Uh, the, the, the idea is, you know, you have nine dots. You can do it right now if you have pencil and paper, make three rows of three dots. The idea is, can you connect all those dots with four continuous straight lines. So you can't take your pencil or pen off the paper and can you connect them all? Um, hold that question for a moment, I'll come back to that. Okay, but the, for me this sort of captures the way we look at things in terms of this idea of solving puzzles. All right, so hold on to that. Um, what I wanna do then is, is to invite us to do some reconsidering which involves some reframing. Um, to, to think about something different, to step back and be willing to be surprised, to imagine that the framework that you've employed hasn't always worked and there might be another frame that it's the same thing you're seeing but with a new frame it all looks different. And one of the, the, the things for me that captures that sense of the power of reframing or what I, what I like to help me think about it is the gestalt pictures. I'm sure you've probably seen these before. Um, the, the amazing thing about gestalt pictures is there's always two pictures there that are open and available to you, but you can only ever see one at a time. Right? You can see the two faces or the chalice between them. You can see the older woman uh, from the side or the young woman from behind. Uh, it all depends on what you choose from. What frame are you bringing to bear? Or, I love this poem from a 17th century Japanese poet. Barns burned down. <gasps> now I can see the moon. Both are true. Which will we look at? Which frame will we bring about? And as we begin to reframe, then we're able to reconsider, to think about it again, to be willing to call some of our assumptions into question, not calling them wrong, testing whether they're still adequate as a frame to help us see the world and the church that we're in. To, to flesh this out a little bit, to think a little bit more about putting this into a slightly different context, to reframe or reconsider, uh, I want to borrow uh, a, a triptych, a, a threefold way of thinking about the life of institutions. And I'm borrowing this from the first chapter of a book called uh, The Missional Leader by Alan Roxborough and Fred Romanuk. Um, and what they do is they're trying to offer a lens, a frame for thinking about church growth ups and downs. And I just found it so interesting that I think you can apply it to a variety of situations, not just churches. 
um, businesses, political movements, social movements, uh, as well as the church. And so they have three kind of phases that they say the church, and I would say almost any institution goes through in its history of development. The first one they call the emergent, or I would call the inventive phase, or the inventive zone. And there are some distinct characteristics of this phase of an institution's life, as there are for all three. And here, essentially the situation that you need to know is when you're in that emergent inventive phase, you're doing something new. Uh, you're starting something or you're restarting something. But the common denominator is you know you don't know how to do it yet. You've got a good idea and some energy and some things you want to test out, but deep down you know you don't have it figured out. And so some of the characteristics associated with this period of an institution's life is that there's a high value on experimentation, right? which also means there's a high, a high tolerance for failure. You're going to experiment, you're going to make mistakes. High value for experimentation. You have relatively loose affiliations. That is, you, you want partners, but you can't partner too tightly yet because you don't know what you're doing exactly yet. So you're willing to kind of sidle up to just about anyone who's doing something similar. Um, there's very little regulation. Regulation typically is the enemy of experimentation. It's very difficult to experiment when you're worrying about whether or not you're following the rules. There's a relatively fluid identity. Okay, you, you know where you want to go, but you don't know who you are there yet because you're not there. And there's relatively haphazard growth. This is the reason most startups fail, whether you're talking about a restaurant, a business, a mission. Um, across the board, we do not recognize just how long it will take to figure things out, how much resources we need to bring to bear, or how crazy the ride is early on when you're, when you're still experimenting. All right, so imagine, though, this institution, church, company, whatever, has begun to figure things out. Then you move to the second zone, and typically the longest period in a healthy institution's life, and that's what they call the performative zone. And the performative zone or phase also has some characteristics. And here, the emphasis, the main emphasis shifts from experimenting, because you don't know what you're doing, you have an idea and you're experimenting, to, okay, now you've more or less figured out what you want to do, you've figured out where you're going, and so the emphasis shifts from experimenting to competent performance. Now that we know what we're doing, how do we get better at it? Right? We, we're not going to spend all of our, as much energy experimenting because we've really we've kind of fallen into our wheelhouse. Now let's keep getting better and better. And along with that comes more defined partnerships. We know who we are, so we know who it's more advantageous to partner with. We begin developing regulatory structures because now that we know what we're doing, we want to make sure the whole operation is doing it in a similar way. I think in churches, this is what the rise of denominations and seminaries. We got in our footing. We wanted to pass on what we had learned. We'd figured out, wanted to pass it on. We have a much more stable identity. We've, we've kind of gotten there. We know who we are. And this is a period of steady growth. Often it's growth that follows in business circles what they talk about as a classic S-curve. You begin to accelerate when you really hit your stride, you're moving. Eventually the situation changes a little and begins to taper off a, a bit, but it's all growth. Um, the last stage, when you have begun to taper off or when the context has changed significantly and what you're doing or have been doing doesn't seem to be working as well, most institutions fall into what they call the reactive zone. And the reactive zone is when it's not working as well, and so you do it harder and better and with more energy, and it doesn't seem to help. And that makes you first nervous and then anxious and then scared and then highly reactive. Um, similar characteristics. Now let's move from competent performance. How do we keep getting better at what we're doing to establish practices? Out of that anxiety, you want to go back to what used to work. And the emphasis becomes very much, well, this worked. We just clearly we're not doing it well enough or better enough. Let's get back to the core, get back to the root, get back to what used to work and make sure everyone's doing it. Your partnerships begin to decay because you begin to get a little insular. You start looking inside, you're circling the wagons. You don't have time to be worrying about all these partnerships and friends. Let them care for themselves. We've got to get back on track. There's increased regulation because you're convinced that the key is to get back to the way it was, and if we're failing, it's because people aren't, so we're going to make more rules and make sure. Right? I think of this as the vision and expectations part. So it's just a little joke for Lutherans, and even they apparently are not quite ready to go there. <laughs> um, we're going to regulate our way out of this. Uh, you tend to fall into a more defensive identity, and by defensive I mean when you're in the reactive zone, a lot of the conversation revolves around defining yourselves by what you're not. 
which uh, is really um, positive in the sense, or effective at building that stable, close identity. We are joined by what we fear. That's powerful. But it's very difficult to attract others into it. So what are, what are you? Well, we're not this. That's cool, but what are you? What do you really believe? Well, we don't believe that. Got it, but who are you? We're not them, right? It helps rallying the troops. It makes it impossibly difficult to invite people into those circles. Um, and the danger at this point, the particular danger is nostalgia. And nostalgia, very, very shorthand, is reminiscing and longing for a past that, truth be told, never happened. Right? It's looking back to the glory days. And the problem with that is that you lift up this past that didn't actually exist, and you compare the present to it unfavorably. It pulls your energy to the past, and it saps your energy for imagining anything different. Uh, it's a tremendous trap. And then finally, this is the period of declining growth. So really quickly, the growth trends as, for institutions as they go through this kind of movement. Haphazard at first, they hit the S-curve of their growth. Notice the reactive zone doesn't start with decline. It starts with tapering off. You begin to taper off, you get nervous. You get more restricted, more constricted, and then you begin to plateau, and then you really get anxious, and then from that point on, you're being led by fear, and almost everything begins to tailspin out. Now, I want to kind of play with this just for a moment before we get to the church. When I, when I, and this is just for fun. Like, this is just above and beyond the price of admittance. Admit. <laughs> um, I just found this really kind of captivating to think about a variety of institutions. So I was kind of stretching it and kind of playing with it and see how it worked. And it occurred to me there's a way in which I think this helps me to understand the development of the New Testament. So just for a second, think about this with me. And if, if you totally disagree, that's okay. Um, tell Glenn. No. <laughs> um, so let's think about the, where the New Testament begins and where it goes. Not narratively with the Gospels, but chronologically. And what we have first are the letters of Paul. And we tend to, particularly Protestants, tend to make Paul into a systematic theologian. And he's not. He is, to borrow a current term, a missional pastor. He's an evangelist. He's out and about. He's had, I mean, Paul, Paul's a really interesting, interesting figure. Because here's a guy who was, Paul was not a seeker, ever. Right? He's just got the absolute confidence and certitude in almost everything he does. And so he is not looking for an answer to his problems. He's confronted by an answer that creates all kinds of problems for him. Right? He thought he knew the game, and all of a sudden he gets this voice from heaven, this different answer than he imagined, and everything's up for grabs. And the rest of his life, in a sense, is trying to figure out what that meant. And the, the shorthand for Paul is in Christ, right? to be in Christ. And there are times where he's kind of waxing philosophical and theological, and then he goes into praise, and all of a sudden it's like he gets so excited, all he can say is, in Christ. <laughs> you know, like, that's what I'm talking about. And so Paul then takes this entirely new lens and begins to look at relationships with other believers, with non-believers, with food, with law, with the covenants. He looks at it all differently. Um, and again, we can tend to make him a systematic theologian where he's kind of this wild man evangelist trying to figure things out as he goes, regularly shooting from the hip. So when you think about um, Paul, one of the passages that comes to mind for a lot of us is the Corinthians 13. Um, there is uh, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. Right? He says almost something nearly identical in Thessalonians, naming faith, hope, and love again. But there he says the chief thing is we don't read these Thessalonians much, do we? <laughs> it's hope. Now, is he inconsistent? No, the context shifts. The Corinthians are tearing themselves apart. They need love, right? Burt Bacharach and Paul, they both agree. <laughs> In Thessalonica, they're worried about they've missed the end times. They're afraid that the, the rapture or whatever, not the rapture, that, that Christ's return has come and they've missed the boat. What they need is hope. Right, so Paul's this kind of interesting, and I would describe inventive, emergent theologian, and that's what his writings reflect. After a while, the religion Paul promulgates and the community of disciples around Jesus grows sufficiently that they begin to figure it out enough. They get established enough that what do they want? They want a competent performance of the Jesus story. Right? And Luke says that. You've, you know, there are a whole lot of stories out there. Many and various people have tried to sit down an orderly account of the things that happened among us. I'm going to do it again because we need a little bit of order here. We need to get our story straight. 
Um, and so the Gospels are this kind of competent performance of the Jesus story in, in a new way. And then what happens over time, the context changes. And there are schisms, and there are challenges, and there's persecution. And out of that, what do we get? We get the pastorals, which are pretty reactive. All of a sudden, they're worried about, like, who can be a presbyter? Who can be an elder? Who should preach? And what are the rules here? And, and okay, let's just admit, this is what makes the pastoral so damn hard to preach. <laughs> there's not a lot of, like, energy there. There's a lot, it feels a lot more about kind of caving in. So, Okay, back to our regularly scheduled programming. I just think that's, I just think it's kind of an interesting little way to think about things. Okay, so mainline churches, and this is what, what Roxburgh and Ramana do more with. Um, here, thinking about these phases, uh, not so much as historical periods, uh, like across the board, but that they can happen in different sequences. So the inventive or emergent here in this country is the immigrant period, when these immigrants are bringing their faith with them. And, and what I mean is that they, it might happen in the 17, 1800s in the East, the middle 1800s in the Midwest, the 1900s in the West. So it's not chronological in that sense. It's more that they follow this pattern. And we tend to get a little bit nostalgic about the immigrant period. Right? We, we look back and be like, oh my goodness, all those boats of Germans, Swedes, and Norwegians. <laughs> that was the day, <laughs> you know? And some historians lately, and I'm, again, making fun of my Lutheran tribe a little, historians have said, you know, have helped to, to make us more realistic. First of all, only about one in five of the people coming from Europe joined churches when they got here, right? It wasn't everybody. Um, now, one in five, when you're talking about a couple hundred thousand people, is, is great, but it's one in five. And for me, that reminds me that you don't need everyone to, to do a phenomenal work. You need a critical mass. And that one in five of people who are coming here with their, with their faith have built that social network and system we were talking about earlier, caring for 2% of the population every day. Um, but also, we tend to think like they just, they got here, they just did church like they used to do it, and it was always happy and good. And when you read the literature, the Parsons literature, whether the pastor or the pastor's spouses, it's really interesting to see or discover that they felt like they had no idea what they were doing because most of them came from state churches. And the frontier, whether it was New England, Midwest, or the West, the frontier when they first got here was this wild and woolly, diverse, they didn't have the term, but they would have used a pluralistic setting. And they had no idea how to be church. And they experimented and tried to figure out, and things failed, and things worked, and all kinds of things. And we forget all that because we just sort of like, are prone to nostalgia. So they get it going, they get it, work it out, and then they begin to fashion their churches, and it grows, and denominations grow, and seminaries, and colleges, and all the rest, and they accrue cultural influence, and that's what we call the main line, until the 60s or 70s, when that influence begins to wither, and the church begins to age, and so then the critics of the main line call it the old line, or sometimes the side line, and if you track the growth of mainline traditions, traditions coming out of the Reformation, you can pretty much see the trend with some spikes related to immigration across the board. Now, the interesting thing for all this, and where I want to get with this kind of extended analysis, is that when you are in the reactive zone, there is really only one solution. Now, that doesn't mean there's only one outcome. There's definitely more than one outcome. One of them that we don't like to think about is death, right? Not all. Uh, institutions, whether they're social movements or churches or companies, not all of them pull out of the reactive zone. First time I was kind of working on this, I happened to be working with a, a group of ecumenical uh, church leaders in the Rochester, New York area. And it was literally two weeks after Kodak had closed, um, which was both economically devastating but also identity devastating. And they were kind of grappling with, with what that meant. And, and, and you can understand almost intuitively how difficult that was because really, who could have imagined 25 years ago Kodak going out of the camera and film business? I mean, their tagline was the truth, Kodak is film, and it was. And the problem was that as digital photography became more popular, they bet all their resources on film. Why? Because film's better. To this day, it takes better pictures. So they bet it on film, and digital photography began to spread, and they bet it on film, and digital photography spread even more, and they bet it on film, because they knew it was better, it always worked, it always would be better. Now, right near the end, they got very creative and came out with some great products and cameras, too little, too late, and all of a sudden, they're done. They're not in chapter 11 reorganizing, they're done. 
right? So that's clearly one option. You know what you've done worked. It's better than what you're seeing right now. You're going to stick to it come hell or high water. Um, if you want to move beyond reactive to something else, then there is only one solution. And that is to give up the idea that you really know what you're doing and recognize the context has changed sufficiently that you need to go back to being a beginner, to be a learner, to go back to the emergent inventive phase. You need to be willing to experiment, which means, and this is the hard part, you need to be willing to fail and make mistakes. And I have this little theory that the more degrees you have, the harder it is to fail. Because you've kind of built your level of accomplishments higher and higher and higher, and the fall feels that much more frightening. So now, back to the nine dot puzzle. Um, there's no way to solve the nine dot puzzle that way. And if you're anything like me, you'll like do it, and you'll do it, and you'll do it, and then you'll start scribbling. <laughs> and then you'll become convinced that it's not really a solvable puzzle. It's a puzzle of how long stubborn people will keep trying to do the same problem. <laughs> it turns out that the solution is just to move beyond the lines. And the interesting thing is, of course, when they do this over and over, over again, nobody ever says those dots are a boundary. But we so crave a sense of boundary and security and order that we see it there and we confine ourselves to it. So what is it, literally, to move beyond the box and to think about this in a different way? To get at that, I want to think a little bit about, or share a scene or so, a little bit from one of my favorite films the last couple of years. Actually, one of my favorite books, too, Moneyball. Um, and I want to kind of tee this up by thinking about, you, you might have seen the film, some may have read the, the book, the, the, the tagline or the, um, what are those things called, the little title, subtitle, thank you, of Michael Lewis's book, Moneyball, The Art of Winning an Unfair Game. Baseball became unfair at a certain point in its history. For most of baseball's history, the key to having a winning team was to have a good scouting organization and good player development. And that was it. And all of a sudden, in the 70s, television comes around. And television begins uh, pumping all kinds of money, but it's dispersed unevenly, or it's dispersed according to market share. So big market share, big city teams like New York, like Boston, like Philly, have all this money. I know, a lot of Phillies fans saying, <laughs> and how has that helped us? <laughs> All, all this money, whereas like little market teams, like the Oakland A's, where this film takes place, or to just be nostalgic myself, the Minnesota Twins, don't have that much money. And it becomes a wildly unfair game. Uh, and so the setup for the film is that the Oakland A's have yet again fielded a very strong team and now have had their free agents, because the other thing that changes, free agency comes along, they're no longer indentured servants. After a period of time, they can go to the highest bidder. Um, they lose their three-star players, and they're rebuilding. And so the clip that I want to show is of Billy Bean. He's the manager of the Oakland A's, played by Brad Pitt. Um, general, manager. general manager, thank you. Thank you. Uh, who is uh, sitting in, in a reorganizational meeting with his scouts. Um, OK. We're trying to solve the problem. Not like this, you're not, you're not even looking at the problem. We're very aware of the problem. Can you hear it? Okay, good. What's the problem? Look, Billy, we all understand what the problem is. We have to replace. Okay, good. What's the problem? The problem is we have to replace three key players in our no. life. No, what's the problem? Same as the other men. We've got to replace the fact of what we have to No, what's the problem there? We need 38 home runs, 100 points RBIs, and 42 players to replace. The problem we're trying to solve that there are rich teams and there are poor teams. Then there's 50 feet of crap. And then there's us. <laughs> it's an unfair game. And now we've been gutted. Organ donors for the rich. Boston's taking our kidneys. Yankees are taking our heart. And you guys are sitting around talking the same old good body nonsense like we're selling jeans. Like we're looking for Fabio. We are the last dog at the bowl. You see what happens to the runs of the litter? He dies. Really, that's very touching. 
story of me, but I think we're all very much aware of what we're facing here. You have a lot of experience and wisdom in this room now. You need to have a little bit of faith. Let us do the job of replacing Gianni. Is there another first base like Gianni? And if there was, could we afford it? And what the f talking about? <laughs> if we try to play like the Yankees in here, we will lose some Yankees out there. Well, that sounds like fortune cookie wizard to me, Billy. No, that's just logic. Who's bad here? <laughs> I don't know if you could catch the response to that. Someone else says he's a shortstop for St. Louis. <laughs> All right, so if you haven't seen it because you're not sure you're like a baseball film, it's not a baseball. Well, it is a baseball film, but it's also a film about change, about culture, about leadership. Um, really worth watching. What I love about this and what makes the reason I get a pang every time I watch it is it reminds me of so many church council meetings <laughs> or vestry or board of elders or session meetings. Um, I dare not say faculty meetings, those are totally different, of course. <laughs> um, but, you know, we know what the problem is. Uh, and this, this, you know, the problem is not enough people are coming. The problem is we can't get Sunday school teachers like we used to. The problem is people don't give anymore. The problem is, no, the problem is being a leader in the church today is a very unfair game. Because the church changed. The world changed, rather, almost entirely while we were watching and we're trying to figure out how to respond. And the challenge is to not keep going back to all the things that used to work when the world was the way we liked it a little better. So this is that invitation to reconsider. Um, and I want to start with kind of a really simple one, but I think it's really important. And that is, I want to start with reconsidering questions and the power of questions. In fact, I want to invite you to, to consider rethinking and reclaiming the power of three very overlooked words. I don't know. And again, my theory is the more degrees, the more time you spend in school, the more education you've collected, the harder it is to say those words because you feel like you're betraying all that credentialing, like that somehow you must not have been paying attention. Um, but I want to, I want to actually, what I want to reconsider is the way we think about intelligence. Um, to do that, I want to put up a, a couple of little pictures. I'm going to imagine this guy. I'm going to call him just for fun. I'm going to call him the thinker. And. <laughs> And I want you to imagine that the thought bubble is, contains all that the thinker knows, like all his knowledge, like that's what he knows. Um, and then to think about the perimeter of that, which we almost never pay attention to, we think of intelligence like, oh, it's all the stuff you know. But to recognize there's a perimeter there, and that's the edge of what you know you don't know. All the stuff you know you don't know yet. Now, I want to bring a friend along, um, thinker two. And thinker two knows more. And so immediately say, clearly smarter, knows a lot more. And the bubble's bigger. But again, pay attention to the perimeter. What happened there? The perimeter's bigger, too. What if we think differently about intelligence? It's not just knowing more stuff. It's knowing how much more you have to learn. That the mark of intelligence isn't just all the stuff you know. It's all the stuff you're hungry to figure out. It's your curiosity. It's your willingness to reckon with the fact that you don't know everything and there's a whole big exciting world out there. It's your capacity for mystery. Um, if so, then we can reclaim those three overlook words, especially when we accompany them with four more, which is what do you think? And do you see the shift there? There's kind of an act of both humility and freedom. I don't know, it's hard to say, it's vulnerability. We get anxious that people think we're not doing our job if we admit we don't know but then to be able to follow up by invitation. What do you think? And suddenly it's not one person, it's multiple people bringing their combined wisdom experience to solve it. One of my favorite podcasts is a podcast called Freakonomics and it's by the guys who wrote the books. Um, and one of the themes they've come across a couple of times in the book, the most recent book uh, and the podcast is that to their imagining, to their experience, they do a lot of consulting now, um, the most debilitating cultural element of business in the US right now is an inability for people to not admit when they don't know the answer to a question. Right, the manager asks a question, boss asks a question, you don't know, you're terrified you're gonna lose your job, you give one. And the reason it's debilitating is because one, a lot of the answers are bad and they follow, waste a lot of time going down the long road and it deprives people of the chance of learning. 
So can we imagine that way? And if we can, then if there's one thing I could mandate, and I can't, but if I could, one thing I could mandate for every parish, every church, every congregation, it would be, it would to be do a series of every member visits or cottage meetings around this question. What do we need from this church? Not just what do we want more people, more money. What do, we, what do we need? What would meet your spiritual needs? What would equip you to live your life? What would help you navigate this crazy world where jobs are shifting and kids grow up so fast and social media, you don't know, do all of that stuff. What do you really need from this congregation? Uh, and when you have answered that, then the second part of that is to get outside your church and ask your community together what they need from this congregation. Now, when you're doing the the cottage meeting th kind of thing, our tendency is to, is to begin in the conversations with what's going wrong? What do we need to fix? Resist that urge. Because you will pile up the problems in a five minutes and you'll be overwhelmed and have no energy to address them. Instead, when you're talking about what you need, talk about what's already there. What are the strengths? What are the assets? What are the blessings? that you see around you. Because what happens is you start naming all these good things going on that you had taken for granted or not even seen, and the assets begin to pile up. And trust me, you'll hit problems, but then you'll have all this energy and blessings to address it with. Then go out and start asking the people in your community, the, the shopkeepers and the school principals and the uh, law enforcement officials and the neighbors around you. What do they need? Now again, there's a tricky way to ask this. If you, were, you know, one way is to say, if we were to close our day, doors tomorrow, what would you miss? And that's a scary way to do it because they might say, wait, 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 where are you again? <laughs> Instead, what you might do is say, what could we do together that this community needs that if we closed in five years, you would really miss us? What does this place need from us? And I know it's scary to go out and talk with people. Some churches I know have dealt with this by once a month for a year, bring in groups from the community, whether it's firefighters or school teachers or chamber of commerce or neighbors, and just have adult forums to, to, to talk about the way they see the community, the way they see the needs, and the way they would dream of having you as a partner. One of the huge underutilized resources that most congregations have because we framed it as a liability, is space. Too much space, deferred maintenance, we can't keep it up, all of that. And yet, the number of groups around you that would kill to have that space that's being used for a couple hours a week. Um, all right, so I want to first reconsider this whole way we think about intelligence and the power of a good, good question. Second, I want to reconsider the problem we've been describing. Our tendency, again, is, is to reduce it to this, to attendance. And as long as you see the problem this way, then the answer really is only to, what we, what, to do what we've always done, but better. Except really with energy. Better! <laughs> and in a lot of ways, I think that's the way we've addressed our challenges for the last 30 years. So what we've done is we think, oh, worship isn't, doesn't seem to appeal to this new generation. Let's get a drum set. <laughs> right? We'll do... You know, we haven't thought differently about the nature or purpose or structure of worship at all. We've just kind of jazzed it up with, with music that was contemporary 20 years ago. Um, <laughs> but um, bum. <laughs> all right. I think the same has happened with preaching. You know, so the trend was for a while, like, okay, preaching doesn't need to be working. Let's get screens. Let's put screens up. We'll do it on PowerPoint, which, by the way, is like the perfectly named technology. Make the same old points with power, <laughs> you know? I mean, we haven't thought differently about the nature of proclamation or the way it might function in the disciple's life. We've just done it better, and it's exhausting. Um, so I want to reconsider the problem, and I think we've already begun that way. What we've said was the problem isn't, like all that other stuff are symptoms. The problem is that people don't know the story anymore. The story isn't meaningful for them. It's not helping them navigate their lives. And for that reason, there's an increasing disconnect between the story told on Sunday and the rest of their lives to the point where they have, they're having a very hard time identifying the presence of God in their life, in their world, and so see no reason to keep coming to church except out of a sense of duty. Or to frame it another way, and I'll borrow this from Walter Brueggemann. I was almost going to say from Brueggemann's latest book, because it came out like a year and a half ago, but knowing Brueggemann, that was probably like three books ago. <laughs> All right, so from a recent book by Walter Brueggemann, uh, Preaching in the Prophetic Imagination, Brueggemann writes, for most of our people, God is no longer a primary actor in the story of their lives. Now notice, he's not saying our people don't believe. He's saying they have a very hard time 
imagining how God is actively a part of their lives. And when you think about the kind of poles of options that our popular religious culture has given us, it makes sense. What do you have? You have on the one hand the very personalized God who takes care of your every want and whim, or at least that's what you're hoping for. I remember when I was a part of InterVarsity Christian Fellowship uh, in college, which is a meaningful experience, part of the fellowship, and we were going to a Christian rock concert, and we were late. And if you know anything about InterVarsity, you know it was a Christian rock concert. And if you know anything about me, you knew we were late. <laughs> so we're going late. And I remember like having this little group prayer session on the way, eyes closed except for the driver, <laughs> praying that God would save us a parking space so we wouldn't miss the edification of the concert. <laughs> Like, God has nothing better to do than to save a parking spot for us when we get there. But I think we all fall into that from time to time. We, we're in a drought, and yet we're going to still pray for good weather for the church picnic. I mean, this, that's one way of kind of relativizing the, the God of Scripture, domesticating. The other side, of course, is the other extreme where God is present, usually in tragedy, punishing the wicked. So think back to, we're just celebrating, not celebrating, observing the 10th anniversary of Katrina, and going back to some of the awful sermons we heard about how Katrina was the punishment for New Orleans and for all their sins. And it, that kind of theology makes us throw up. But that's like, those are the popular options. Little personal individualized things are punishing through tragedy. No wonder it's hard. Um, our folks have a hard time imagining God as part of their lives. And if we can reconsider the problem that way, we could begin to think about, if not a solution, at least a response. That is, if we need the capacity to imagine that God is a primary actor, not just in the biblical story, but in our lives, then what we really need, one of the primary tasks of our ministry, needs to be about forming, cultivating biblical imagination. Now, that's a great term. I didn't make that one up. Um, but I want to unpack that a little bit. I want to think about what do I mean by biblical imagination. To do that, I want to show the first couple minutes of a scene from the third season of The West Wing. Yes. Church. Oh, I don't know where you're going to hell. What was the problem? It feels a homily like Panache. It did like Panache. It's a lovely homily on Ephesians 5.21. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Yeah, she's skipping over the part that says, wives, be subject to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. I do skip over that part. Why? Because it's stupid. <laughs> Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by washing of water with the word, that he might present the church to himself in something. In splendor, and I have no problem with Ephesians. And any time you want me to cleanse you with the washing of water, you know I'm up for it. <laughs> <laughs> this is a Hackery. Oh, this guy was a hack. He had a captive audience. And the way I know that is that I tried to tunnel out of there several times. He had an audience and he didn't know what to do with it. What, the same Bellari? Couldn't have heard words. The words were so not loud for the performance of music. They have rhythm and pitch and timbre and volume. These are the properties of music, and music has the ability to find us and move us and lift us up in ways that little being can. Do you see? You are an art's horrible snob. Yes, I am, and God loves me for it. You said you said you did have gross stuff, not you can't just trot out a season, which you blew, by the way. It has nothing to do with husbands and wives, it's all of us. St. Paul begins the passage, be subject to one another out of reverence to Christ. Be subject to one another. In this day and age of 24-hour cable crap devoted to feeding the voyeuristic gluttony of an American public, hooked on a bad soap opera that's passing itself off as important, don't you think you might be able to find some relevance in verse 21? How do we end the cycle? Be subject to one another. So, this is about you. No, it's not about me. Well, yes, it is about me, but tomorrow it'll be about somebody else. We'll watch Larry King and see who. All hacks off the stage right now. That's a national security order. I'm going to the residence. I'm taking a bath. I'm turning on Sinatra. How does Mrs. Sinatra feel about that? He said, You make me hate hey, Fu Young. Good morning, Mr. President. You make me feel there were songs in the song. Hey, Spicy, please. Don't ask me about church. No, I won't. I'm sorry. Mr. President, lost the work he died. Yeah, okay.
What do you think I should do in there? I'd wait a couple of hours to ask some more facts. You talk to the sheriff's office? Yeah. And I guess at the end. Yeah, but you don't want to look too far into that. Good morning. You heard? Yeah. Since you had a chance, I should wait a few hours. Um, okay. Thank you, Mr. Be subject to one another, Leo. What can I do to be a subject to you? I'm fine. Yeah? I've got Margaret. Okay, what I love about that uh, scene, first of all, I love the fact that they talk about preaching in church. I wish we had more conversations like that. But it's that last part. You can find most of that clip on YouTube. Just Google Ephesians, uh, West Wing Ephesians 5. They cut off after CJ turns to leave and before what I think is the, the line that pulls this together, when the president, having just had this discussion about the sermon and the text, turns to Leo and says, how can I be of subject to you? Right, that's biblical imagination. It's not knowing facts and figures or being able to cite stories or chapter and verse. It's that having spent time in these stories, the stories have created you possibilities of speaking and doing that would otherwise be unavailable to you. Right, that's biblical imagination is how the stories create openness where the culture says things are closed, or the world says things are closed. Um, think about for a minute like Next to John 3.16, probably the best known passage in scripture, known by more people, is the beginning of Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall, I shall not want. Think about the power, really the revolutionary power of that phrase, living at a time and in a world that makes you want to want 24-7. How much energy and money is spent in trying to create in you want the sense that you do not have enough, that you are not enough, in order to sell you something, promising that that will make you enough. Right? It's a lie we fall for again and again and again, a testimony of how powerful it is. When we get over a little bit of high of buying something new and we feel empty again, we look to go shopping once more. And in that context, what would it be like for a congregation to live with the passage, because the Lord is our shepherd, we will not want, we will trust that there's enough, more than enough, for us and for the people around us. That's biblical imagination, making these stories available that they can create possibilities of different ways of being and acting in the world. The good news is that it's entirely possible to cultivate biblical imagination, but it takes practice. One of my very favorite sayings comes from the violin teacher, Sinichi Suzuki, where he says, knowledge is not skill. Knowledge is skill practiced a thousand times. The reason there's a violin up there is because I probably learned more about how we acquire imagination and competency and gifts by watching my kids go through Suzuki violin than anything else. I don't know if you know much about Suzuki, but he, uh, he came of age at a time as a teacher when it was pretty much standard practice that you did not start a student on violin until they were in late adolescence, early adulthood. It was just considered too difficult. And one day Suzuki's asked if he'd teach the son of a prominent person in his community, and he's about to say yes, and the little boy steps out and he's four years old. Way too young to learn the violin. And so then Suzuki is about to say no, but he's one of those people that's willing to rethink the conventional wisdom. So instead he says, can I think about it? And he goes away for a weekend and kind of thinks this through, how would one do it if it was possible? Um, and he has what he then calls the intellectual breakthrough of his life. And one of the challenges for Suzuki was the rest of his life he spent explaining it to people or sort of summarizing this insight he had and nobody thought it was particularly ingenious. I feel that way all the time. <laughs> Mostly kidding. Um, so here's the way it works. Suzuki came back. He said, I'm going to take the four-year-old on. They said, you're crazy. He said, no, no, no. I, I figured it out. I said, what are you going to do? He says, well, don't you realize every child born in Japan knows Japanese? And I'm like, yeah? He's like, no, that's it. That was my breakthrough. Every child born in Japan knows Japanese. And I'm like, yeah? And he's like, no, 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 don't you understand? Japanese is considered one of the most difficult languages in the world. And yet no child fails to learn. If you can teach a kid Japanese, why can't you teach a kid the violin? And so he starts thinking about how do we learn language? And it distills just a couple principles. He says, one, um, we learn language by first listening to competent performance a lot. Like before the child's you know, muscles, palate has formed, 
they hear people talking all the time, and that internalizes certain norms about what's, what counts as speech. And so when you're a Suzuki parent, your child, before he or she touches the violin, for months you are listening to the music that they will play over the first year or two of their instruction. You get a little CD, or probably now an uh, uh, MP3 file, and you play it over and 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 over. I'm not kidding, and over and over and over and over and over again until we all have it coming out of our pores. And the beauty of this is when the kid's learning a piece of music and they make a wrong note, they're like, oh, that was wrong. Let me try it again. Right? So the first is that co examples of competent performance. Um, the second is that the teacher takes a very complex task and breaks it down into really small parts. And you start with the most basic and you build from there. And, and so before kids touch the violin again, first thing they do is learn how to stand and how to take a bow, and then how to hold the violin. Except it's not a violin, it's like a little box with a paint stirrer. And then it's a wooden stick for the bow. And as the parent, actually I should, as the paying parent, <laughs> part of you is like, is the kid ever going to make some music? <laughs> but what Suzuki has done is realize that the only way to learn things is by developing mastery. And so you start simple, you practice, 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 you build some competence, that leads to confidence, you take more on, and there's just a cycle of success. Um, the third thing Suzuki realizes is that students are immediately in a, a context of high affirmation as well as high expectations. And so I actually was inspired by my kids watching this. I took violin lessons for a little while from one of their teachers, and no matter how bad I, I was, the first thing out of the teacher's mouth after every piece was, very good. Now let's try it again this way. Right, you've seen this with good choral directors. You're learning a new setting of the liturgy or a new hymn. Very good. Now let's try it again this way. Right, and the last thing was that the key to getting better was practice. Again and again and again. In fact, Suzuki had this question. He would, from time to time, get asked, and this is a story Suzuki teachers love to tell. Do we really have to practice every day? And Suzuki's answer, the Suzuki teacher's answer is always, I'll tell you what, practice only on the days how about if you practice only on the days you eat? Now, part of that is, yes, every day. But the other part of it is, you really get good at things when it becomes a part of your regular routine, like breathing, sleeping, waking, eating, practicing. And through that, then you, you demonstrate mastery. And the promise Suzuki teachers make and keep is that musical ability has nothing to do with it. There is not innate musical ability, which runs contrary to all of our thoughts. You give me a kid for a decade, and that kid will know how to play the violin, but they will have to work to get there to practice. So what I want to do is kind of think about that's the key to cultivating anything, including biblical imagination, is this commitment to a process that relies heavily on practice. And so what I want to suggest is that really, if we're wanting to cultivate biblical imagination, there's no better time to do that than on Sunday morning. But before we can do that, we need to admit something, and that is that we are in a state of denial. <laughs> and this is one of those generation dividers. There's a whole group of people here who are like, who is that? And I'm just here to, Sergeant Schultz, I know nothing, I see nothing. This is the way I describe the denial. I think most of today's generation of pastoral leaders lead active fantasy lives. Now, in case you're nervous, I want to reassure you, they are wholesome fantasies. <laughs> I'd even describe it as a holy vision. It goes something like this. People will come to worship on Sunday morning and be so inspired by the worship and the preaching and the music that they will leave making all kinds of connections between the biblical story and their story. And they will then share those connections. They will share their faith with the people around them and over time invite them to come to church, the place that so energized them. And very seriously, isn't that exactly what we work for, prepare for, pray for, hope for? Absolutely, it's a holy vision. It is also a fantasy. And the primary reason it's a fantasy is that adults like us derive most of our identity from our areas of competence, from what we are good at. Right? Little kids, if you ever work with little kids, aren't like that. They start out, they have no sense of being good or bad at things. They just love to do it. And that lasts through more or less middle school. And in middle school, beginning in high school, kids begin to think about what they're good at, what they're not. If they go to college, they choose a major. By the time they're an adult in a career, they've gotten very good at some things, and they know they're not at others. And when you take an adult 
like us and put us in a situation of new learning, our anxiety goes through the roof. This is why it's hard for adults to take up a musical instrument or learn another language. It's not impossible. It's that we feel so incompetent, we want to bail. Right? There are adults, um, retirees learning musical instruments all over the place. And tons of people, tons of adults are learning new languages as refugees because they have to. And they can. But we don't, and so we won't. Um, so now think about those three components of the Holy Vision. People will make all kinds of connections between the biblical story and their story. They will, share those, they will share their faith with the people around them and invite people to come to church. When's the last time any of our people had a chance to practice that anywhere? And if they're not learning that and practicing that in the relatively safe confines of worship, they will not do it outside of worship in a much more ambivalent world. That's why it's a fantasy. Now, um, I want to think about how we, we move beyond that. And to do that, I want to share something I learned when I was a new teacher and, and really wanted to, to get better at teaching. I mean, the odd thing about PhD programs is they give you all kinds of courses in your subject material and almost no courses in teaching. And I'm seeing a couple light bulbs come on <laughs> as we talk. Um, so as a early, new teacher, a couple of us wanted to get better. And so we got to work with someone and um, started thinking about adult learning and how people learn and all of that. And a phrase I came across that really took me a while to figure out was the null curriculum. And I want to unpack that a little because it became really helpful to me. Um, I, and the reason it was hard was that I knew what null meant, zero. I knew course of what curriculum was. It's a course of study. What's the zero course of study? Someone finally taught me or explained to me that the null curriculum essentially says this. What you teach matters. But over time, what you do not teach also matters. Any subject matter you want to cover, you know you can't cover everything, so you make choices. And those choices are reflected on your syllabus or your presentation or your lecture. You can't do it all. By your choices, you are communicating what's most important, which means that you're also communicating what's not important. So if I were going to do a class on great theologians of the Western tradition, whether it's a semester-long seminary course or three weeks of an adult forum or whatever, and I taught you only about dead white men, noting for a moment that there are a whole lot of great dead white men out there to study. I mean, you can do Anselm and Aquinas and Abelard, and you're like only on the A's, right? <laughs> um, but if that's all I talk about, then I've also said something powerful about women theologians and African, Indian, Asian theologians. Clearly, they're not as important as I would have talked about them. That's the null curriculum. What you say matters, and over time, what you don't say also speaks volumes. So what I want to go back to Sunday is say, what we do every Sunday, whether we mean it or not, is what we are saying to our people is the most important thing for Christians to do here. And notice, it's not any of the elements of the holy vision. Instead, it's, well, let's sum things up really quickly. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Wow. You, like, totally got that. I didn't have to put it on the screen. I didn't have to prompt you. You didn't need a bulletin. Where does that kind of competence come from? Practice. Over and over and over again. So maybe the problem is that we're out of practice. We've stopped because we had so much help from the culture, we didn't need to. But that's gone, and now you do. So if that's true, then maybe we can come to reconsider the purpose of Sunday morning worship. Maybe Sunday morning worship can become the God-given time in which we rehearse and practice our Christian lives in the world. So my very brief kind of message here is if it matters to you, give people a chance to practice. And if you are not, what does not happen on Sunday morning will not happen the rest of the week. And I know you're thinking, yeah, but what else? Sunday school and adult forum and all. The lion's share of your people, the time they have with you is on Sunday morning worship. If it's not happening in worship, it's not happening. That is just the way it is. So if it matters, whether it's connecting faith and life, sharing our faith, thinking about faith and money, engaging in acts of mercy, inviting others to church, being generous, if it's not happening on Sunday, if we're not practicing it, it will not happen outside of worship either.
If we can, though, reimagine Sunday morning as a place of practice, then the cathedral, in a way, can become that place of vocational training where we, where we learn, in fact, to detect God's presence in the world and answer God's call. What we discover is that worship was not meant to be the performance. Worship is the rehearsal. Worship is not the big game. It's the practice. Can we think about our sanctuaries as locker rooms? <laughs> it takes a bit of a stretch, I know. What we are saying, though, is that life is the game. Life is the place God meets us, which goes back, in fact, to our Reformation roots, where Sunday was not the most important day of the week. Sunday equipped you. Sunday taught you to be the church in the world. You went to church to learn how to be the church. Um, At its best, church prepares us for life, which suddenly creates a kind of rationale of why you come back. Because after a week of struggle and figuring things out and trying to work it out, you want to come back and learn some more and be encouraged to go back out there again. Um, in a way, it reminds me of a scene from C.S. Lewis's The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. You might remember Chronicles of Narnia, this is number three. Um, the first one, the Pevensey children go to, from London to Narnia, have these adventures, they come back, they go again with Prince Caspian. At the end of Prince Caspian, uh, Aslan, the, the great lion of the, the story, tells the two oldest, Peter and Susan, that they will not come back to Narnia again, they're too old. So in the third book, it's Lucy and Edmund uh, and their cousin Eustace. And they have this adventure, and they're on the Dawn Treader, Prince Caspian's boat. And at the end of the journey, they come to the edge of the Eastern Sea, where the emperor of the East is to live. And they walk off the boat, and they walk on the water, and they meet their Aslan. And Aslan comes to them on this field of lilies. And I can't remember if this is the part where then Aslan turns from a lion into a lamb which really, if you think about it, is C.S. Lewis's way of beating us over the head with the idea that Aslan's really Jesus. (laughs) Sorry, spoiler alert. (laughs) All right, so so Aslan then meets the, the, uh, the kids, and he says to Lucy and Edmund, you also will not come back to Narnia again. And little Lucy, of course, is distraught. Dear Aslan, will I never see you again? And Aslan says, you will see me in your own world. And Lucy says, what? You're in my own world too? And then Aslan says, the whole reason for bringing you to Narnia for a time, dear child, was so that knowing me well here, you could see me there. Isn't that a great metaphor for church? Like what we confess about church is that it's not that this is the only place God is, but it's where God is most clearly present in the forgiveness of sins, in the sacraments, in the proclamation of the gospel. We get to really see God revealed in Jesus there so that we can go and recognize Jesus, God at work in Jesus everywhere else. If we can see God here, then maybe we'll see God everywhere else. All right, which for me, invites me to think about, to reconsider the purpose of preaching. So I'm just gonna spend a couple minutes on this because this is the area where I've worked the most. Um, I think it extends to other parts of our ministry, but I just wanna play with this, and it's also very public, and for most of us, it's really at the core of our office and who we are. Um, So what I wanna invite is moving from a performative style of preaching to what I would call a more formative style of preaching and ministry for that matter. And I'll, and I'll, um, first I wanna unpack performative. I don't mean this again pejorative, like, oh, you just are a performer, you, you think your job is to entertain. I'm not talking about that. I wanna be as descriptively accurate as possible, that in most sermons there is one person who is in fact performing the sermon on behalf of and before the others. And the rest of us are listeners or audience. So that in this model, which is the model I learned, it's the model I've taught and still work at, it's a model I highly value, but I also wanna put it on the table and think about it, reconsider. In this model, the preacher typically is the only one that speaks, it's a, it's a monologue, and I know, again, liturgically, it's a provisional monologue, it's catalytic speech that invites a response from the congregation, the hymn and the creed, I get it. But for that 12 or 20 minutes, it's a monologue. Uh, the preacher is the one that stands up and wears the special clothing. When my kids were little, they would talk about daddy's white dress. <laughs> you know? I think it's easier for us to forget the authority that goes with clothing the, the, of a uniform. We'll do things for doctors that we wouldn't do and it's for anyone else. Um, and again, I recognize that, that if you've been to seminary, you know that, that particularly in traditions that wear the alb, the white alb is not a, a, a marker 
of, of, of a higher office. It's a, it's a reminder that everyone gathered is clothed in the righteousness of Christ through baptism, and it's a reminder of that. But again, I would say, if you haven't been to seminary, how many people know that? And the answer is almost nobody. Um, third, the preacher is the interpreter of scripture. I can't remember the last time a preacher stopped and said, you know, I've been working on this for a while, but some of you have heard this passage more than I have. What do you think? Some of you have been on this journey of faith far longer than I have. What do you think Jesus is saying here? It doesn't happen. It's not the way we're trained. And the preacher is the one who makes the connections between faith and life. In fact, that's our key indicator of a good sermon. Did the preacher surprise me by connecting that dusty old story with something that's relevant in my daily life? It's what, it's what I try to do. It's what most of us try to do. My concern right now is that the better we get at that style of preaching today, the deeper our crisis gets. Because to, to, in the response of brilliant preaching, uh, in the face of brilliant preaching, there's a two-part response. The first one is the audible one. Pastor, that was such a great sermon. We are so lucky you're our preacher. The second one is the part that is unsaid, and I could never do that. Right? So I want to kind of imagine if that is the, the best or the only way to think about preaching. Um, when I was in seminary, what I was taught was that the, the purpose of preaching was to create faith. This is the efficacious word, the power of the gospel to create faith. And the signature verse is Romans 10, faith comes from what is heard. What is heard is the word of Christ. And I love that theology and value it highly. What I wasn't taught, or might have not been paying as close attention as I should have been, but I don't remember, was there might be another purpose of preaching, which is to help people see God in their lives. Maybe a different verse here. Maybe the end of Jesus' sermon in his hometown. Today, the script, or the whole of Jesus' sermon in his hometown. Today, the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. That is, what if we decided that every time we sent someone out, that was the promise? That our job was to, to, to open up the text in a way that we could say, today the scripture filled. That is, you will see this passage play out in your lives as you leave. You will see the truth of it spread across the world in your lives. When you think the purpose of preaching is primarily to create faith, you ask some questions, important questions. What is the gospel? Where is God active? Critical to ask, I think. When you see it as seeing God also, some other questions. Where do you see this passage in everyday life? What does this passage look like when it becomes true in our lives and for us? So maybe there are two purposes of preaching, to create faith and to cultivate biblical imagination through practice. Now, good news and bad news. Um, and I've been uh, married to an accountant for 21 years, so I will start with the bad news. That's what I've been trained to do. Bad news first, there is no playbook for this way of preaching or being a minister. I mean, it's, it's, it just wasn't what we were taught. And I, I think sometimes we don't realize that sometimes we tend to think of seminaries. We don't intend this, but we think of falling to think of seminaries as the place where you're given the playbook, right? The minister's desk edition. <laughs> and, and, and you are taught to run the plays, um, which is why it's so anxiety provoking when you'd feel like you, you weren't taught. The number of times I've heard senior pastors say, I had a great seminary education, I just don't think it was for the world I'm actually ministering in anymore. Um, but the good news is, and there is good news, the good news is, wait for it, wait for it, there is no playbook. <laughs> you do not have to conform to the models passed on to you. You do not have to do it the same way you've always done it. You are free. You are free to experiment and to play and to let some things go. You are free, in short, to color outside the lines. Now, I have this little theory. There's no way to prove it, but I'm pretty sure it's true. And that is that no child in the history of the world has ever asked for a coloring book unless he or she saw someone else with it. That is, let me put it this way. No child has come to a parent and said, Mom, Dad, I'm having a fabulous time just scribbling all over the page, but I'm no longer satisfied with the representational quality of my drawing. <laughs> I've heard there are these books out there where everything's outlined. <laughs> can you buy one so I can draw in the lines? Like, no, kids don't. Who buys the coloring book? The parent or the grandparent? Why? It's for a very good reason because we want to recognize what the heck they're drawing. <laughs> like, after a while, we get tired of saying, those are beautiful scribbles, Sally. 
What we want to be able to say is, that's a beautiful sailboat, Sally. That's a wonderful house, Billy. But remember, Billy, sky is blue, grass is green. And that's where it starts, the art of conformity. Picasso once said, every child is born an artist. The challenge is keeping the artist alive to adulthood. So how do we cultivate a generation of entrepreneurs, a generation of artists, a generation of people who will experiment and stumble and fall and count on the community to pick them back up again and try it over and over again? And if we can do that, one more. All of this for me then calls us to reconsider the nature of pastoral ministry itself. And here I want to move from performer to coach. Because what, co what is a coach valued for? Um, a coach is not valued for how good they are at it. They're valued for how much they can get out of a team, how much better they can help a team to be. I happened to hear on NPR, Phil Jackson turned 70 today. <laughs> Just a fun fact. <laughs> what we loved about Phil Jackson was he could take any set of five players and get more out of them. Or I want to put Cheryl Reeve up on the screen there for a minute too, because I think it's really important to note these are gender inclusive images. Um, and also because I still kind of follow sports in Minnesota, and Cheryl Reeve is the only coach of a professional team in the whole darn state who knows how to win. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so coach is one way of thinking about it. Um, what about Whitewater River Raft Guide? Right, think about it. These guys, they've been down the river before many, many times. They're not going down to have an adventure. They're going down to help you have an adventure. They're going down to help you have an experience you have not had before. That's the way they deploy their expertise, to take you someplace you didn't know you could go. Or, I got this one from the, uh, the Bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of Chicago, which I just thought was brilliant. What about Julia Child? Can you think of yourself as Julia Child? <laughs> How many of you have seen the movie Julia and Julia? Another wonderful feel-good movie. Before, I'll confess, before watching it, I did not know the, the, the relative hostility of the environment in which Julia Child learned to cook. I mean, I should have. She's an American in France. She's a woman in a male-dominated field. It didn't occur to me. What I love about Julia Child is the moment she figures it out, her first thought is, if I can do this, anybody can do this. And she spends the rest of her career essentially demystifying something that had previously been beyond the reach of the typical American homemaker. Um, and, and she had no problem making mistakes. Like, you know she's going to drop that fish, <laughs> right? Or says something else. And if she does, you know what she'll do? She'll pick it up. Oh, oh she'll pick up the fish, put it back in the, the pan. <laughs> right, and that is my Julia Child. <laughs> uh, you're, you're very generous. <laughs> But now think about it, the, 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 when we saw Julia Child set her kitchen on fire, or drop the fish and pick it back up again, what was awesome about that was it made us feel better about our mistakes, right? She was an expert deploying her expertise to help us get better, not to intimidate us by the quality of her performance. Um, one more, what about a conductor? This is Osmo Vanska, conductor of the Minnesota Orchestra. Uh, a friend of mine plays in the orchestra, and she said, you know, we, we love playing with Osmo for a couple of reasons. One, he is so passionate about music, and it's true, when you go, partly you're going to see him bring, embody the music. Second, though, she said, you know, he, he knows the Scandinavian catalog of music so well, which is a very good thing in Minnesota. Um, and third, she said, but what we most love about Osmo is we never play better than when he's on the stage. Isn't that the testimony? Right, because you're there, we're better. Um, if you have not seen the TED Talk by Benjamin Zander, just go to TED.com, search for Zander, Z-A-N-D-E-R, watch it. Zander's been the composer of the Boston Philharmonic for a number of years. Uh, his whole career has been as a composer, uh, not as a composer, a conductor. And he said midway through his career, he'd been doing it for 20 years, when he had the signature breakthrough of his life. Changed everything, although people didn't understand. See, there's a theme here. Um, Xander said, I realized in the middle of a concert, while bringing the Western canon of music to life for a huge crowd, I realized I was the only one standing on stage who made no sound. My job is to make everyone else sound better. 
Right? Isn't that wonderful? And so he came back the next day. He said, people could tell instantly that he was different. And they say, Ben, your conducting is so different. What are you doing? I make no sound. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right? But isn't that kind of a way of thinking about it? See, and here's the mark between performative leadership and formative leadership. In performative leadership, you're judged for how good you are at it. When we call a new pastor, we want them to be a good preacher and a good teacher and a good caregiver and good prayer. Formative leadership, that shifts. The mark of competence is now how good you are, but after three or five or seven years, how much better is your congregation at interpreting the story and sharing their faith and caring for each other and praying? Right? That's what I want to kind of advocate. And to, to wrap up, one last image or picture to sort of summarize the shift that I want us to make, which means really what? We have to give up a lot. It will feel like dying. And Christians should not be afraid of that because that's the promise. Death does not have the last word. And as we give up, we may find that we are blown like a feather. What a beautiful image and resurrected in the spirit. One last uh, picture or image. Um, actually, a couple pictures of, we'd been, this was a while ago, our kids were little, we'd been in Minnesota a couple years, um, and we decided to do the kind of quintessentially Minnesota thing, which was to go north to the lakes. And so we went with some friends, and we got a couple cabins by a lake, and we rented a boat for a couple days. We're going to teach our kids to water ski. I'll tell you in advance, my kids are not terribly adventuresome. Like, I don't have to worry about next, what crazy thing they're going to do, because they don't do crazy things. They do other ridiculous things, but not crazy things. So my daughter, my uh, six-year-old, was like, yeah, Dad, no way. <laughs> it's not happening. My eight-year-old was willing to try. And these are a couple pictures of teaching Jack to water ski. So first picture, I don't know how well you can see. Like, we're in the water with him. It's, first of all, it's not skis. It's a board. The rope comes up, comes up to him. He just has to hold on. We're there with him. I don't know if you can tell, but his little brow is quite furrowed, <laughs> you know? <laughs> And he's really holding on, and he's very anxious. All right, second picture is now he's going. He's doing a little, and he's kind of holding on for dear life. This third picture is one of my favorites of the ones we've ever taken of our kids because he's doing it. And again, I may read into it, but I think he's just kind of relaxing a little, and he's realizing he can do something he never thought he could do. And where am I? way in the back, right? Almost so far back I'm blurry, but even though it's blurry, you can see two things. Huge smile and applause. What if that's the mark of faithful pastoral leadership today? That when all is said and done, your people are doing things they did not imagine they could do, and all that's left for you is to stand back and give thanks to God. So um, I told my son Jack that I was using this picture, and he got very embarrassed. And then real sheepishly, he said, but do you ever show him the other one? Because, OK, this was the Minnesota thing. And I could admit this here. I actually can't say it in Minnesota. We didn't go back to the lake for eight years. <laughs> and the next time we went was in New York. <laughs> yeah. uh, and there we got a boat again, taught our kids to water ski. And this is him skiing. So I want to come full circle in our last minute. I want to come full, full circle back to the story because there's, a, there's an ending to the story. Um, Raleigh and the sky have the long talk on the airplane. And at the end of it, Raleigh says, I really appreciate you trusting me with that story. Have you told your pastor this, that your life is so busy, you're not getting it out of it, you're not going to go to church anymore? And the guy said, no, we haven't. And he said, do me a favor, do that. Tell him. And he said, I will. So a month or so goes by, and Raleigh gets two emails one week. The first email is from the pastor. And the pastor just says, you know, I want you to know that you had an impact on the guy on the plane. He came in to tell me about it, and we had a good conversation. I just want to say thank you. Um, otherwise, it would have been one more person that left the church, and I didn't know why. Now, when I tell the story to everyday Christians, someone almost always pipes up and says, why don't you know why? Why don't you ask people when they leave church? <laughs> Exactly. I have to remind them that pastors are like other people. We're insecure. And we're afraid if we ask people why they're not coming to church anymore, their answer is going to be, because of you. <laughs> you know, I don't like you, or you've done this. Like, we, so we often, we grieve, but we often don't ask. 
the second letter came from the gentleman himself. And he said, you know, I did what you said. I had to talk to my pastor. I want to tell you what happened. Um, when we were done, my pastor said, can we do this again on Sunday morning? That is, instead of the sermon, can we repeat this conversation? Will you share your story with the congregation? And he said, I will. So that's what they did. Sunday morning, one service, 120 people in worship. When they were done, the pastor said, and I thought this took a lot of guts, the pastor said, how many other people feel like this? And more than a dozen hands went up in the air. And the pastor said, whoa, we gotta stop. And we gotta think together about how we can create worship that means something to you. And that, the guy closed his letter by saying, and that's what we're doing. And we're in. We're staying. This is hard work, I know. But it's also really good work. Work worth giving your life to. And I am so grateful for this company of people who have done just that. So I'd like to end, um, we're at our end time, with. Uh, with a quick reminder and then a prayer. And the quick reminder is simply that the earliest Christians were not called Christians. They were called people of the way. They did not have it all figured out, but they were on the path. And sometimes that path is awesome, and sometimes it's really hard. But whatever it is, that's who we are. Not perfect, not totally having it together, but people called and claimed by Christ to share the good news. And so I'm gonna ask that as our prayer for God's speed, we read together a beloved prayer from the service of Matins. Lord God, you have called your servants to ventures of which we cannot see the ending, by paths as yet untrodden, through perils unknown. Give us faith to go out with good courage, not knowing where we go, but only that your hand is leading us and your love is supporting us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord.